Hello, everyone. Welcome. Happy Leap Day, February 29th. One, one of our goals will be to do this particular webinar four years from now and see, you know, how, how are we tracking? Welcome to this webinar. I am your moderator, Nick Lamparelli. The title of this is Attr Attracting and Retaining Knowledge and Talent in the Insurance Industry. You may have noticed in the promotion for this that we did biographies and introductions for a lot of the folks. So rather than spending five or 10 minutes going through a traditional set of introductions, I'm going to introduce the panel. We can go to the bio slide. So first, we have a star-studded cast here. We get Tony Cotto, who's who's with uh, representing NAMIC, which for any of you that may not know, NAMIC is the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. They have thousands of members who are mutual insurers throughout the U United States. And uh, Tony's doing a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to lobbying and making sure that the mutuals have a fighting chance to compete. We have Jeff Rice, who's one of those mutuals. He's president and CEO of Wayne Cooperative Insurance Company in upstate New York um, and has quite a bit to say about what it is that we're doing. And he is actually a use case for, for one of our demographics that we'll be talking about. We have the person that has, to me, the, uh, the most gorgeous Italian name, Marguerite Tortortello, just used to be with the AIPCA and now is executive director of insurance careers movement. So very fitting to have Marguerite on this. I'm going to skip over the next guy. I want to save him for last. Joseph D'Souza, who's the founder and CEO of Pro Navigator, which is a knowledge management insure tech, um, originally based in Canada. And Joe, is, Joe has made his way south. So the, the cold weather was just a little bit too much for him. And I'm grateful that he's joined us. And last but not least, magician, the the probably the greatest insurance magician that is walking the face of the earth, which is Tony Kanyas. If the screen looks like it's gonna, is set on fire, it's not actually, it's part of the magic trick that Tony is going to execute on. So no need, no need to worry. Can we, I, I apologize, can we go back one slide and just go through the objectives before I jump in and start talking to everyone? So, the the cha the title of this is attracting and retaining knowledge and insurance talents in in the insurance industry, and we're going to start off by going into some statistics. But there's some significant challenges, and I would almost classify these as existential, meaning we could see a large amount of what we deem as really critical small and mid-sized insurance organizations facing a moment of truth because of the our our struggles with attracting and retaining talent in the insurance work uh, in the insurance industry so the it's already difficult enough to attract we're going to go into some statistics that's going to show that we're actually having a struggle with a shrinking talent pool this is not just a problem in insurance which makes the problem in insurance even doubly more difficult we're, we're going to spend most of our time talking about strategies for attracting and retaining young talent. And we got just the right panel to be able to discuss to discuss that. And interestingly enough, with a lot of the talent retiring and leaving the workforce, we have another additional strategy session or uh, to discuss around how do we retain that wisdom, that knowledge, that intuition and not just let it walk out the door? How do we retain it and move it to the younger generation that has decided to join us? So we'll go to agenda item one, please. The shrinking ta talent pool and its impact. Next slide, please. Okay. So in our preparation for this, we, you know, we, we have been blogging in promoting this particular webinar around one particular fact, which is there we are at, um, you know, retirements from peak 65 means that they're going to be starting around now. There are millions of folks who are going to retire 
in the next few years. And a lot of those folks are going to come from the insurance industry. Um, we also learned in our preparation for this that there's a, there's a double-edged sword that's associated with this, which is since the financial crisis, college enrollment has dramatically dropped off. And for most positions that are in the insurance sphere, a college degree is usually required. So not only have we struggled to retain or, or attract folks to the insurance industry, the pool that exists from which we want to attract from is getting smaller and smaller, which makes it even more difficult. So I'm going to throw this out. Marguerite, I would like to start with you with, since you were with Insurance Careers Movement. So this is like, you know, probably the thing that you think about absolutely every single day. Initial thoughts around, clearly you started a movement in an organization to try to attract young talent. When you see statistics like this, how does, what does that do? What is, how does that make you feel? So when I look at it, I think about how there's even more statistics we could add on. We could add on the threats from parents questioning the cost of college, students questioning the cost of college that worth the investment of these insane prices that are happening. We have additional pressures from looking at what's happening in the economy. People are trying to decide what is a proper career path. You see pressures from other sectors shedding jobs, companies being more lean, really looking at are they adding more positions. There's so much from these two glaring statistics, and then you add in other layers. And so there's this immense pressure on the insurance industry to really think about how are we going to be creative in really building out that talent pipeline and really looking at how do we start earlier? How do we start in grade school or not start, excuse me, how do we enhance our work in grade schools and in high schools right now? And I know we'll get into the solutions in a minute, but it is very, very high priority for the industry and executives across the country are focusing on the talent pipeline. And then Joseph, I'll turn it to you because I know you were talking about the retirement peak and how that's going to happen. But from the early ages, it's really scary to think about what's happening with the numbers and the financial threats. So Joseph, what do you think on the other end of retirements? Yeah, so we come from, I guess, a different perspective. We're in sure techs. I'm seven years young into the industry, so I have a lot to learn. But when I started Pro get seven years ago, attracting, fostering young talent, it was a hot topic, whether it was a brokerage we work with, an agency or carrier. Uh, and seven years later, it's still a hot topic. But now it feels like it's here. And from what I've read in a couple of different reports, uh, we're going to have a talent deficit in our industry of probably 400,000 positions in the US and Canada alone. And this year, 2024, has been labeled as peak 65. And what peak 65 is, for those who don't know, is about 4.1 million Americans will turn 65 this year. And that's more than 11,000 each day. And that level will just continue all the way till 2027. So, you know, when you think about how much of our workforce is going to be aging out of our industry, uh, but, you know, multiple industries, but specifically insurance, the knowledge and talent gap that could leave, it's really going to get exasperated. And I know the institutes have done a lot of work and research on it. And some of what we're seeing, um, some of the biggest needs will be middle and senior management positions. I think the next one was commercial roles. And then closely followed behind was actuarial professionals, brokers, sales producers, and broker support staff. They were very, very close behind. So it really feels like it's it's um, it's kind of here today, this year, and we'll continue to go through through 27. I'm not, I'm not sure if Yahoo Finance is listening to me on my <laughs> phone, but I, I got a notification message this morning, Joseph, to this point that um, the Federal Reserve is actually estimating that the retirement is actually accelerating, that their models that they were using to predict the number of folks who are beginning to retire and what that's going to look like was off. So it's actually, some of these numbers might actually be understated. And, you know, the financial crisis had a lot to do with what happened. And, you know, COVID as well, Tony Cotto, right. um, I'm interested to hear since you get to see or get to see and speak to a wide cross section of insurance companies, thousands of them who are part of NAMIC. What are you what are you hearing around these particular statistics? Are they aware? Um, do they realize what is happening around that? What are you, what are you hearing? Thank you, Nick. Yes, absolutely. You know what, what in 
as you mentioned, you know, NAMIC, we have about 1,500 member companies all across the country. We're proud to represent the smallest insurance company in the country and the largest. So we do hear a big cross-section. And I will tell you uniformly what we are starting to hear, that conversation that Joe was talking about from a few years ago and how it's here. We are not facing a talent gap in this industry. We are facing a talent cliff. Okay? This is what, and, and we are up against a universe in which there's all these other opportunities and people think it's not cool to be in insurance. And a lot of what our members are thinking about is not just succession planning for your top leadership, but how do you get the talent coming in at the ground level? Like, And we'll talk more about solutions, but how can you actually explain to someone that insurance isn't just being an insurance agent? There's so many other things that you can do. And those are conversations that in all fairness, probably should have happened seven years ago when Joe was talking about, <laughs> but they are happening at a faster pace, which is good. And we are, in addition to having the conversations, and I know Jeff will talk about some of, of the sort of use case experience, but it's not just getting into the schools like Marguerite's talking right. about. It's also finding ways to show, hey, you know, once you have, once you're in the door, and I imagine Tony will speak to this. Once you're in the door, there's a lot of things that our company does that you may not know about. Right. And, you know, the cross-training opportunities and all our members are worried about the future, but I think they're starting to find ways to deal with it if they can get the bodies in the door. Uh, Joseph talked about uh, the, the roles, right? Commercial lines, leadership roles, uh, we have a ton of, of young professionals in, in, in our industry who fell into it by accident, who ha now have five, seven, eight years of maybe 10 years of, of, of experience, but who have grown up in an insurance industry post-2009 where the, the expense cutting of the post-2009 era, right, the training programs didn't come back. Basically, we have lots of people that are stuck in, in call centers uh, doing personal lines claims, doing personal lines customer service doing basically telemarketing and they've gained the insurance experience but they don't even have an idea of the roles that exist in the rest of the industry and no idea how to get there and and, and the carriers seem lost on on even realizing they have that talent there it was part of the reason we created insurance nurse originally was to, to give them a roadmap uh, but, yeah. but we're this big right compared to a two million people industry yeah jeff rice you're you're going to be speaking on this topic last but not least um, it, jeff you're actually part of the problem um, it, yes, I am. Your, it's it's not your fault. <laughs> uh, it, you, you're you're you, we have discussed this. You are set to retire in 2025. You've been discussing yep. the system, succession, but this hits your company like particularly hard. Like you, I, you, as far as use cases go, you are like on the on the podium around both sides of this, attracting, and you're also leaving as well. You've had a you've had a nice career. As well, talk about it from the standpoint of an individual firm. You're unique. You're a small-ish mutual in a very rural area in upstate New York. Talk about the what those statistics mean to you and what you have seen over the last few years as well. And as, as the previous speakers uh, both spoke about, how did we get in the insurance industry? Uh, I'm one of the baby boomers at the end of the generation, right? 62, 65, working up there, getting getting out. Uh, I backed into this industry myself. So I was in the banking industry. So next thing you know, boom, I'm in the, in the insurance industry uh, through no fault of my own and loved it. Uh, what we're, we're seeing right now is we're, we're, I hate to say we're lucky because we are so small. Because we all wear many hats within our within our particular company, therefore, any employee coming into the Wayne Cooperative or had actually sees the whole operation can actually see their impact in that op operation, whether it be claims, underwriting, investments. I mean, for the most part, they can see what their impact on the next employee over is, which is a huge benefit for us. And from an internship standpoint, we've developed the internships that allowed a, a college student, even to the high school level. We've had high school level people come in just to see the whole organization because it's all under one roof. You can see everything. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I think I think by the time we get done, Jeff, you're going to be so excited about this conversation. You may postpone your retirement. That's you know, fingers <laughs> crossed. The, the the IT guy says maybe you might want to too. <laughs> but just just say hey, keep having the fun, but not necessarily the responsibility. How's that? Yeah, uh, fine, <laughs> fine. We are fun, and, and that's something that we will we will communicate. So you know, we I didn't want to spend too much time. Um, you know, getting stuck on the dire consequences, and this is existential. It's cliff. Okay, so let's we we all agree this is problematic. Let's spend most of our time talking about recruiting and retaining young talent. Joe, I want to start with you because as we discussed before, you're essentially an outsider coming in. You're a technologist and an entrepreneur coming in and getting, you know, you got many years now of getting acquainted with to the insurance space, but the rest of us are, have been in this. And I almost feel as though we need outside eyeballs to kind of tell us, the stereotype, like you're coming into our space as a technologist and entrepreneur. What were your initial um, stereotypes or intuition about what you were going to bump into? So what I found really interesting, and even to Jeff's story and from what we're hearing from customers, is that a lot of insurance organizations today are, are valuing soft skills over job-specific knowledge and technical skills. And I find that so interesting for a couple of reasons. I think one, this wave of AI and automation and concerns of how it's going to impact our industry, soft skills are going to always be needed. You know, empathy, communication, adaptability, some of the things that attracted me to this industry. Um, and I feel like some of those soft skills are often more challenging to teach than the, than the technical hard skills. You know, a great company can teach the hard skills of the industry, but it's harder to teach some of those, some of those soft skills. And so, you know, that starts to open up uh, other industries where we can recruit talent from, right? I mean, Jeff, you mentioned banking. Um, folks with no insurance backgrounds, we're seeing our customers train them and bring them into roles. Receptionists, teachers, folks who are comfortable in roles that require problem solving and interpersonal communication. So I think that that continuing to kind of double down on like, you don't necessarily need to come in with all this knowledge of how to underwrite and how to you know place risk and if you have those soft skills those hard skills can be taught um, and that's a way i think for us to be able to kind of attract more people but one of the things that i think attracted me to the industry i mean you you i remember like on an airplane you're landing and you just see like this entire city below and like everything as far as you can see um is insured uh, or, or rather maybe probably should be insured, which really just is so much opportunity, right? I, I, um, I actually immigrated to Canada as an immigrant. There's so much opportunity for you to come into an industry like this and learn and some of the best people you're ever going to meet. Um, I, I've loved it. I've enjoyed every every moment of it. And I just think it's, it's a phenomenal industry with so many career options and opportunities for, for new folks. Marguerite, can you add on to that a little bit? Can you talk about... Um... You hinted about, you know, the the push to go younger, right? Like it, it, it's it, especially given that statistics about the small, the shrinking talent, the shrinking college graduate pool, that we might have to leapfrog college right. and go into situations. I know Tony Cotto and Jeff Rice could probably speak to some initiatives on the mutual side, but can you, for from insurance careers movement, if if we try to do that. Most young folks are not exposed to insurance until they buy a car and they, right. and that, that might be the first opportunity. And my, I, I just now try, I have a niece that's entering the space now. And I had a conversation with her about, Hey, you're making a good choice here. And I told her about the potential career opportunities and she's coming into the space and she's mm -hmm. like, I had no idea, you know? How how have you been, or how what have you seen? What what are we, what are we going to do to what are we going to need to do to engage high school students when they are completely unfamiliar with the topic? Do we need to bring right. Tony Kanyas to every <laughs> high school show to do a magic trick to get them interested? Well, I definitely think we should bring Tony to every high school to do a magic trick, or create a huge video series with him so we can beam it into every high school. 
he's fantastic. But I think that's one of Tony's superpowers. He's so great at storytelling. And what I think is exciting is you're seeing the industry really leaning into storytelling and leveraging technology. So Insurance Queries Month, we're so excited for this bonus leap day. But throughout the month, the companies across the across the country as well as around the world have been doing a phenomenal job telling stories of insurance careers and really drilling down this year. So you're seeing companies talk about what are career paths, what are training programs, what are benefits and comps, what's their wellness initiatives, what's their hybrid remote in-person look like. They're doing it not just through like a static image. They're telling really compelling videos. They're doing great blog posts. And that content isn't just on LinkedIn. It's on TikTok. It's on Instagram. It's on so many different platforms that they're really trying to very intentionally target young people and tell a very visual, engaging story. So that's happening across the nation in a very massive way. And it's not just insurance companies, it's the trade associations, it's the insurance um, departments, which is fantastic, the insure techs, the media. So it's exciting to see that collective effort. And then what's also really exciting is you have organizations like Invest, they just announced this month, they are partnering with DECA. So all of those programs where they are going into high schools, they're working with DECA organizations that are already established on insurance activities. So again, how you increase that REIT, it's a very concrete way. You also have the National Alliance for Insurance and Education. They have great high school programs where you can receive a micro credential. It's a great way to help young people see that you can get a credential while you're in high school to jumpstart your career. And then you also have organizations like Zurich and Aon that have amazing apprenticeship programs. They're recognizing that that college path, we cannot place such a strong emphasis on it. We need to build other talent pipelines with different job seekers. So what they're doing in the apprenticeship space is fantastic. And then how they're trying to collaborate and help other organizations be a part of it. It's really exciting. So, so many different touch points, but mm -hmm. what's to me the most exciting, so many organizations and entities are working together. It's really yeah. fantastic. Jeff Rice, you brought up that you have, you have brought high school students into Wayne Co-op. Uh, can you can you discuss what did that what did that look like? And, and I, I think it probably is important as well, Jeff, to discuss like were there speed bumps or was there friction? What was what was their take from that? How many of those folks ended up becoming like long term Wayne co op employees? Uh, I would from directly from high school. We've had at least, they had an internship program at the high school level. Uh, out of that, we probably had five or six high school kids come in. Of those six high school kids, two of the, of the kids decided that they didn't really want to go to college. And we picked them up and hired them for their positions. One of them now is essentially a junior underwriter but without a college education, to be honest with you. They have the soft skills. And to, to Joe's point, we, I look at soft skills is I can train some of the other stuff, but you just can't train some of the soft skills. And from this industry, I take a look at it, and the, the problem with the high schools of today are too STEM-related. So you've lost a lot of the other education uh, alternatives that other kids have and had in the past. Yeah. And as, and as far as the internships go, I've turned on five college interns of the five college interns. I think four of them went into the insurance industry in some capacity, whether it was an agent, whether it was an underwriter, uh, or whether it was work here, you know, from that standpoint. But again, it, it's a soft skills. It's knowing that, that we need English majors, history majors. Yes. Uh, and, and, and that's the type of thing that people don't really understand. It, there, and we have said this before, Tony Kanyas has said this many times, like there is a home for you regardless of your your skill sets there's a home when i think of english majors i think of writers copywriting marketing sales right like policy forms documentation like it, go, it goes on and on and, and you would think there's not a fit there but there is a fit and and it's imp really important to note the five or six that you're talking about for wayne co-op that's not a small number Right. Like Wayne sure. Co-op is a is a smallish mutual in a rural area. Five or six is, you know, a double digit percentage of your total workforce. It is not insignificant that you were able to do that. Tony sure. Cotto, you we in in our preparatory discussion for this, you were you were telling me how some NAMIC companies have it as almost a procedural formal process to go to the high schools. 
to to start this process just exactly as Jeff has described. Can you give us a little more color and context to that? Sure. And, and also, you know, when when we talk about stories and and how things have have evolved and we talk about, you know, the great benefits of being in an insurance company, part of the message that a lot of our mutuals are are taking out into the community is this is an opportunity for a career to do good in your community. We're sponsoring the little league teams. We're sponsoring and, and in the same way I like to talk about small and big an insurance career is an opportunity to be there on the best day of someone's life when they open a new store and they have an insurance policy on it and on the worst day of their life when the storm rolls through. Both times, the person that they've turned to is their insurer. And hopefully that kind of relationship, you know, where you're working with the community. I'll, I'll give another example that we recently engaged on some traffic safety initiatives. And we were hearing about one of our member companies that sponsored a child seat installation day with the local fire department outside a, outside a church where the insurer paid for lunch for everyone. And then the cops were there checking to make sure that your safety, your child safety seat was installed correctly after the preacher blessed all the child seats. That's the kind of community building that an insurance career can offer you that honestly, like Great. most jobs are just jobs. And if we can successfully paint the insurance career path as something where you are a community pillar, that's going to have a lot more appeal. And I know Tony can speak to this some too in the research that he's done. Like what millennials and Gen Z and Gen X, are, like how people care about things differently. They want to make an impact in their community. And we're finding more and more that our members are able to recruit better when they pitch that part rather than, hey, come work for an insurance company and make a bunch of money. Great. great. That's a great point. It, not every mutual is in a rural area, right? So it, but those that are can, I think, can really push that lever around. You're doing good for the community by participating here, a along with a lot of like the other cool stuff, like you can become an underwriter and do stuff like that. Tony Kanyas, you're, you're essentially the professor of this. You're, you are an author. So many years ago, you wrote a book called Insuring Tomorrow with your co-founder of insurance nerds, Carly Burnham, about this particular topic. What is it that we're saying here? Is, is anything we're saying here, um, does it disagree with your research in your book? And what what else can you add? Basically, basically because you've you've really studied the younger generation, especially those that are digitally native, right? I, and you, I, you have you have a particular sense for like what they're looking for. I I definitely don't disagree with anything. Uh, millennials mission. I mean, be able to pay a student loan, maybe buy a house someday. Uh, but but mission and and we have that but mission driven generation and we have a wonderful mission every insurance organization has a wonderful mission we're really bad at communicating that mission all the way to the entry level and all the way to the pre hire stage Gen Z a little more complicated uh, they're a generation seeking uh, stability it, it, they've grown up in, in a time of, of utter chaos basically uh, it, and but in insurance we we also have that right we we have Right, like hundred and some year old companies that have been around for a long time, <laughs> and lots of tales to be wrangled. Uh, but uh, post book, what what I've seen a lot with the, the chat with Tony dot com conversations, which I do about four hundred a year, lots of complaints about uh, getting put in the wrong role for 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 their personality type for for what they're good at, and then feeling like a failure and not being helped in finding a better role with, within the company. And number two, we are super, it, it's getting your, every insurance job search is painful, especially your first one, right? How do we make it so, so that it doesn't take hundreds of applications and six interviews at the same company for an entry-level job? We have to be easier to get into. And once they're here, the, the, then we, we have to make it clear to, to, to them that, hey, this is a wonderful career. Let's stop pretending that that the job that you started at is going to be the job you're going to be at forever, or even the company you started at. 
and let's take a more holistic approach and, and be like, hey, give me a couple of years in the claims call center. You will learn a lot, which will make you more valuable. And then we'll, we'll support you, whether you want to grow within claims or whether you want to go to underwriting, whether you want to go to a different area of the company, instead of just letting them drop off, right? Basically, yeah. it, it feels like, like, like at, at the bigger carriers, especially each department, each hiring manager is is worried about its its own little function and not really thinking about, uh, about, about the bigger company or the bigger industry. We need to get better at that, at that coordination between departments, getting people into the right seat at the beginning and helping them grow into the right seat over time. We don't do that well at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want I want to throw out a value proposition to all of you here and, and any anyone. I want you all to add to this. My my feelings about this is that uh, predominantly what Jeff said. I don't think there are any specific. There, I think there are more roles that do not necessarily require a college degree than require a college degree. But could we make this more interesting by recruiting high school students and training them not only for the position in, in insurance, but could we tie a college degree to their job employment? Is, is, would, would the bundling of that create a value proposition for insurance that could be very attractive? Anyone? Nick? Well, Nick, Nick I'll, I'll just note, you know, Part of the challenge also is the paucity of risk management programs. Um, it, it's nice to say, oh, you know, come work here while you get your risk management degree or while you get your insurance specialty, but there aren't that many of them. At the same time, now in a Zoom era with online education, mm -hmm. um, right. yeah, I was just having a conversation recently with a student in California who is enrolled at the Eastern Kentucky University Risk Management mm -hmm. Program right here in, in, in Kentucky. I love it. So I think that be, that's becoming more possible, but it, it's tough to implement. And I, I think you, you're, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, Marguerite, please. I was going to say, I think you're seeing companies put a lot of thought and intention around like the whole cost of education, like Travelers has a pay it forward program where they're trying to help address student debt and then also help people save for retirement. Like they're looking at it holistically through your career span, some really interesting things happening there. I think the work of the Spencer Foundation, what their work on scholarships, I know NAMIC, you guys have great scholarships too, like how people are looking at providing funding. And then also I should say, Laya has scholarships, Naya has scholarships. Like I think in the, really since the pandemic, a much heightened focus on scholarships for the industry, providing interns, Spencer provides internship, paying companies to bring in an intern. So I think companies are really trying to be creative in how they provide financial support in a variety mm -hmm. of ways. I think it is though, I agree, like it's challenging to try and find different solutions and to implement as well. But there and, and I know very Joe, creative work happening. Joe's about to jump in, but I just want to tag on to, you know, Margaret mentioned the NAMIC Foundation We've awarded about six hundred thousand dollars over the last five years, but those are going to kids who have already chosen right. a risk management program because we want to help them further develop and then come into a NAMIC member company. I think the conversation we're having today is a little bit different. It's more of a how do you even get them to consider risk right, management? Point. Like it's easy to target the ones that are already there. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you also, another thing that we haven't really talked about is second careers, right? Like I, I know, I talk to a lot of our member companies and if you talk to like their fraud units, for instance, like they're not recruiting high school kids, they're recruiting former cops, right? Because former cops have a nose for insurance fraud. So that's part of the, the mix we need to be thinking about too. And I'll, I'll be quiet. I know Joe's been chomping at the bit to jump in here. <laughs> no, I was just going to, um, I was thinking about Jeff's story about investing in people and also the perception, how do we change the perception in the industry? And I think one of them is really investing in our people. I mean, that's something I'm kind of hearing a, a thread through here, both in what they need to do their jobs, but I think also in what are the technology and tools they need to be successful. And, you know, sports has a great analogy for this. And Nick, this was something that you had brought up in a conversation we had, you know, the professional sports business, you know, they're in a business, their goal is to make money. Well, how do they make money? They draw large audiences and they do that by having talented and entertaining teams that 
win games. And so rock star athletes are talented that can win games, but it doesn't really stop there, right? Because if it did, why would they, why would you fly a team when they could just take a bus, right? Or why wear cleats when you can wear tennis sneakers out on a field? And so thinking just through what are the resources and mm-hmm. technology that we need in our organizations to really provide our employees what they need to be successful, to be able to move within departments. And if you're trying to attract high school students and you've got legacy systems and they're walking into an environment mm-hmm. with Lotus notes, it takes two hours a day to find the information they need to be successful and do their jobs. Well, I think, I think we're going to have challenges in trying to recruit and retain some of this rock star talent that we absolutely need. Jeez, that 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 is such a. I mean, that, that's a segue to item number three. But that's huge. Like that's you, we're 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 talking about putting a lot of effort and resource in making it attractive, right? And geez, they get here, and it's like uh, I'm going to use old Cosby Show analogies, like putting filet mignon on a garbage can lid, like. Look at this, look at the sizzle of this thing. No one's going to want to eat that afterwards. And it's it's so spot on. Um, I have personal stories, but there's story after story after story that Tony Kanyas and I have both heard in the hundreds of episodes we've done on the podcast about folks who have come into organizations who are just literally not prepared for them or the role that was sold, not the role that they're actually working in. Like it's, it's, it was almost like a stretch goal for that particular role. And so that, I think as an industry, we have to be accountable for that. It's, you know, we we can't talk a good game about, hey, this is an awesome industry. And then they come in, it's filet mignon on a garbage lid. Like that's, that's no bueno (laughs) there. You know, they have lots of, lots of options. Jeff, I, 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 before we go, and we're going to go into this one part and and I'm going to ask one additional question and then Another question to you, because you are you are the person that's going to be leaving, right? So you have already gone through the succession plan and discussed this. But my experience, Jeff, in insurance has been some of the best insurance professionals were not originally insurance professionals. So you have all have hinted at this. Engineers, engineers who found a dead end in their career and were able to resurrect their passion for engineering in the insurance space. I spent quite a bit of my career doing catastrophe modeling. And I remember being at some of these firms and the best modelers were folks who came from computer science. They were failed actuaries. They were actuaries who were just like, I don't want to do the math exams anymore. And they went into catastrophe models. They were economists. They had degrees in economics and went over and we're able to build m- marvelous careers you in the catastrophe space. Jeff, you've run an insurance company for a long time. Um, what, have, what has been your experience about folks who like were able to sort of either resurrect a career or they were going down one path and ended up in insurance and kind of stayed with it. It, it, it filled their cup, so to speak. It, 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 exactly. In, in, when I came in, most of the people that I know or are affiliated with came in the same way we did. We backed into it from that standpoint. Uh, it, it, in, you, you take a look at it, and that's kind of a, a melting, pot, melting pot, essentially, of people that actually work as a team. That it, it's far and away uh, a, a great operation, a great way to come into this into this business. And really, what happens is a lot of times you look to find the talent or look to find that um, the uh, individual strengths and play to it. And that in and of itself will get you a long, long way. Yeah. And that's kind of what yeah. we've done. I've tried to take a look at the strengths of the individuals coming in and play to those strengths. They may not be what we have currently available, but I can envision it and see it. And hey, listen, give me three years, you're gonna like this. And yeah. that's where, like Nick, you, Nick, you said, we had one in, in, internship here, and she says, "Listen, I'm gonna go become an actuary." I, got, I said, "Listen, you get in two years into it. I want you to come back, be another intern, and see where you're at." She calls me up and says, "Listen, Jeff, is there any way that I can get away with just a data statistical analysis degree?" I says, "You'll be farther ahead." She graduated out of RIT and come back to me and said, you wouldn't believe it. She says, I've got more opportunities here and cut off all of the headaches of an actuarial exams and still enjoying my my job. 
it's it's a mar it's a marvelous story. So I I, I want to be respectful of the time that we have left, and hopefully leave some time for Q and A. So Jeff, I'm coming right back to you. <laughs> 2025, you'll there's a deck chair with your name on it, maybe near me here in Florida. Uh, we'll do some golfing or, and stuff like that. But this is a real problem as well. So we're talking about attracting people in, but again, back to the original statistics, there's a whole bunch of people leaving, right? And I've gotten really close with Joe, who's an author and insurance nerds talking about this topic. I was having a discussion with my sister-in-law about this topic and she was like, I had no idea. She's not in insurance, but she's like, I had no idea this is a problem. It, it's, man, it's one thing to have the talent in there, but there's a lot of institutional knowledge that exists in the space. And we just can't allow that to walk out the door. For one thing, it's an asset that's walking out the door. For another thing, it's like it, we were trying to attract younger folks to, to, to Tony's point, man, you get someone stuck in a particular position where they're looking for something, they, they don't know how something works. And the person that knows how it works just retired and never shared that information Jeff, you, you've been involved in a succession plan. Can you talk a little bit about what you've learned, right? I would be very interested to know, like, what you learned that you didn't know, like stuff that was in your head, in the intuition on how to run your business that you've now had to kind of pull out so you can hand the baton off to your successor in a, in a successful way. Talk about your succession plan and, and how you guys have kind of structured this thing. As far as succession plan, you can't start early enough. I'll tell you that. And we probably started just in the nick of time, <laughs> essentially, as it, as it turns out. Because, Nick, you hit, hit nail on the head. You really don't know what all of the innate knowledge that has built up over a 30 to 40 year career. You, you just, it, it, it's, it's unfathomable, to be honest with you. Um, one of the things that we, I've been a strong proponent of is the leadership team and the leadership team make, make, meets regularly uh, and we go over the issues corporate wide, corporate goals, corporate, whatever, so that each department then can, they can see everyone else's department to see the ins and the outs and so forth like that, that, that for the most part, you got to get people involved. You got to get the younger people involved. Um, for years, uh, NAMIC has been in September. Actually, I gave the, the leadership role to run the uh, board meeting in uh, September, always to my second command. So he's done that for the last six years. So and it's these kind of opportunities that you kind of kind of lay off of. And, and then from a board perspective, that is, is even a greater issue because now the board members are saying, oh, Jesus, I don't want to make a decision on succession planning. Jeff, you make it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, 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 wait. No. You know, but ultimately I, I, I said, no, I wasn't. Now I'm kind of more involved with it. So he says, hey, listen, here, here's my recommendation. Here's why. And, and so forth like that. Yeah. Joe, Joe D'Souza, you uh, have built a technology company to hopefully solve this particular problem. Can you, again, as an outsider, right, you, you chose to come into insurance. This is not knowledge management, institutional knowledge management is not just an insurance problem. This is every industry has this problem with those kinds of retirement statistics. Why have, why choose insurance? What are, what are you seeing with your, uh, with your, your eyes around this? Yeah. Thanks, Nick. It's something we've been thinking about for a long time. And because in our knowledge management platform, we have analytics to see what are the types of questions staff are searching for and questions they're asking and looking for answers. And what we saw through the analytics is that a high percentage, sometimes as high as 30% of answers that staff were looking for weren't captured in any document. You know, we spent all the time to capture and document that information, but as high as 30% wasn't there. So what happens? You're putting the customer on hold, you're pinging a manager or a subject matter expert, you're trying to get back to the customer. And I think this is definitely compounded in a remote and distributed work environment where you can't just turn to a colleague and ask them a question. So I'll, maybe I'll, I'll share two non-technical ways and then I'll maybe share a bit of the technology side. I think one is like you can't substitute in person being being fully remote. You can't do that. That time in the office face to face is the best way to learn. There's just like there's no other way around it. So certainly would encourage folks to to do that. I know it's it's easier said than done, but at any time that you know we spend together as a company, as a distributed company. You know, humans have survived as a species because of our ability to connect. And that's who we are. We exchange ideas. We learn. So I would say that's one. 
Two, I would say, try to keep your more tenured experienced staff. I know we joked on the call earlier, Jeff, that you you might want to stick around for longer, <laughs> but is there ways to structure your organization where you can keep that talent, you know, where flexible a couple of days a week, being a resource for your team? Because that institutional DNA is 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 irreplaceable. But kind of speaking to the technology side, I would say kind of two things. One, there's a lot of tools out there to allow you to create documentation to, to communicate asynchronously. And it's really a culture shift. You have to cultivate a culture of whether it's a video recording or a screen recording or an audio recording. You know, in, in, in software companies, it's a very common practice to do pair programming where you have two people sit next to each other and watch each other code and talk and you're doing it at the same time. Well, today, you know, you could be a really good programmer and you could just record and narrate what you're thinking and while you're doing it and share your screen. Um, the mm -hmm. other person can watch it at two and a half X and they can pause it and they can rewind it and they can take notes and you don't have to do this live. And that piece of content is something that's part of your organization forever into the future for anyone else who, who can benefit from it. It really, really scales infinitely. Um, and then through our platform, we're also doing things like this, where we can start to use AI to capture the questions where there is no answer and even draft what we think the answer is based on it being trained on your company's knowledge, but then always have a subject matter expert and a human in the loop to review and improve and edit before that goes back into the knowledge vault so that you can really ensure it's accurate, it's trusted and verified. So I think a lot of these tools that didn't exist when we started and, and certainly just in the last few years to be able to capture that institutional knowledge to not only make your employees' jobs easier and drive efficiencies, but really give you an edge on competition because that knowledge is a superpower. It's how you differentiate. It's that institutional memory and institutional DNA that's been forged through all the all the experiences you had. So really yeah. making an effort to working to preserve that, I think is is absolutely invaluable. And, and you brought up a good point. I'm going to go to a question. It, it must be leap day, must be Italian day as well, because I got one of my favorite people, Joanne Artisani, asked the question for, rem and Joe, you brought up face to face. We didn't even talk about remote. Okay. So let's, let, I think that's huge from a career perspective. Tony Kanyas talks about this quite a bit remote, hybrid organizations. Joanne's question was for remote only employers eager to hire young talent to grow them here. What are some of the key office environmental components we need to have to support their career development? So I'll throw it to Marguerite, Tony, Tony, anyone that would like to take a swing at this or you can all take a swing. Sure. I'll go first, Nick, because I actually work as part of a remote team, despite having our headquarters in Indianapolis with about 100 staff. Uh, my team, because we are lobbying all over the country, we are all remote. And one of the things that we look forward to every year is that once a year, we all come to headquarters for the same two days. We get some face-to-face -face time. We knock out, you know, you can check in with HR, check in with, uh, you know, the, the marketing team, get new business cards. Once a year, our whole team is face-to-face. -face, and those two days are so valuable. You know, we try and meet other times of the year, if we're both crossing over in the same city or the same conference, but you've got to have your whole team together at least a couple times a week. Tony Kanyas, that's this is like a topic you talk about all the time. When, when Joseph was was talking, was talking, I I don't disagree that that there are benefits to 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 in person. Uh, there are benefits in person when, when it comes to, to training, when it comes to team building, when it comes to strategic work. Uh, the problem is is how often we make people come into the office uh, in the traditional carrier space to do their day job. Or even worse, we make them come into the office to sit in a, sit in a Zoom meeting. Uh, don't do that. Right? That's, so, so, that's whatever, so much whatever, worse. So much worse. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, of the way my, my former employer, Jacobson, did it with me. Basically, they brought me in for the first two weeks for intensive in, for intensive in person training, and then they said, "Come back once a month, for a day, for a week, for however long you want, when it, whenever it works best for you." I think that worked really well. The problem with that today, and I was pre-COVID, the problem with that today is there's nobody at the office, right? So I, I think that that maybe bring the whole team in once a quarter, kind of kind of thing, kind of like like Tony was saying. Yes, there are benefits to in person. 
for things like learning something new, not to do the, the day job. And and uh, Gen Z wants that in person touch, uh, but not every day. And and and, and the, uh, the 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 more that 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 let, let's say for example. I mean, twice a week, not too bad, unless you're in a really big city. The problem is then the area that you can recruit from got a lot smaller, right? You can recruit nationally if you're only bringing them in once a quarter. So that's a huge benefit, especially for more specialized roles. Marguerite, did you, I, I have a feeling you have a, you have a strong opinion on this. <laughs> so I think to me, what's exciting is the intentionality you're seeing across the industry. And so on topics like this as well. So when we, it's like, I very much echo what everyone said about being, having a purpose when you're going into the office, make sure you're not just being there for Zoom, but it's also thinking about those remote employees, what experiences are you creating so they can feel linked, even though they may not be in the office, like you don't physically have to go into the office, could you do some walking meetings with people, could you do some virtual coffees, how are you setting up activities with organizations like NAMIC, APCIA, Ross, Spencer, how are you creating events that you would have had in person so you don't have to put all that pressure on the physical structure, it's the intentionality of creating it in a variety of settings. So I think there's some really exciting options and it's not a one size, one way, it's really flexible. And if the employees know you're thinking about them, trying to create an experience, whether it's in person, virtual, combo, that's where I think they're going to feel that engagement. And then Nick, if I could, I want to go back to, can I jump back to Joseph when he was talking about the knowledge transfer for a minute? Would that be okay? Can yeah, I jump on of course. So Joseph, I love what you were talking about with the retirements and the knowledge transfer and capturing information. And I think we're in an exciting place post COVID. It was so fast and so rapid fire and the insurance industry really did a fantastic job of moving very quickly to a very dynamic, intense situation. And I feel the talent cliff that we're at with all these retirements coming, we know it. And so this is an opportunity for companies like right now to have conversations with organizations like Pro Navigators and see how are we really capturing that knowledge and what is our plan? Like we talk about succession planning a lot, like the people, but really having more intentional conversations on that knowledge is so important. And I, from my experience, I think there's a lot of conversations at like executive level succession planning. There are some companies like Auto Club Group that are doing a great job with succession planning for managers, like more in the middle of the organization. But I think there's so much more work that needs to be done. And this whole knowledge transfer is really just, we really need to focus on that. And, can, and if we can use technology to really enhance that experience, I think that would really be fantastic. So I just wanted to call that out more that I think there's a huge gap. The retirements are going to happen really fast. We know about it. We know we can move fast, act fast from COVID, but we need to you have that similar focus and pressure, you know, pressure, and then innovation in this space. So just wanted to add that in. Thank you. No, that's awesome. We, we have exactly two minutes left. And as you could, there's, there is a Q&A button, right? So for folks that want to ask questions, by, by all means, we do have a question from Roger who asked, do you think the traditional insurance companies will ever change their hiring processes? Oops, sorry. Um, hiring processes to speed them up as well as get more competitive in salary. Pay equity is a real thing and needs to change a bit. Tony, Kanyas, you you deal with this like every single day and you're recruiting. I, we, we need to make peace with, with, with the fact that, that for experienced roles, we're dealing with a national market. And, and there are winners and there and are losers in, in that the, the companies in high cost of living places benefit from, from being able to hire people in Iowa, et cetera, uh, and, companies, and, and, and people in very high cost of living places have a disadvantage there. I, I, I think that, that we need to, to, to look at at salaries more often than, than we have been. And, and the, the, the more that we haven't fixed this, this problem, the more that this will be a challenge, especially in a remote first world. But also, I, I'd love to, to see not only, not only pay, pay equity, but also pay transparency, at least internally, right? Uh, which is too often lacking. And you have to be really careful with pay compression. Basically, with a, with a hot What's time that? market, 
if it, it, when, when you're bringing in new people to the company with less experience at higher pay than your existing people with less yeah. experience, right? The, the, the number one predictor of, of people being underpaid compared to the market is how long they've been at the company, uh, especially if, if they started early in their career. Uh, it, and it, it used to be they would stay out of loyalty and they would stay out of geography. That's just not the case anymore. And, and believe me, even though everybody's going through an RTO fight, nobody's going to win it especially for experienced talent. Experienced talent will continue to be, to be able to, to work remotely because they're in that high demand. So you will lose them if you're not paying them to market. Yeah. We are at the end, but I, 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 I'd like to ask Jeff Rice one additional question to just to piggyback on what Tony just said, which is, Jeff, you're the only one in this panel who um, has a salary obligation for insurance professionals like underwriters and actuarial and stuff like that. What From what Tony just said, can you add, how did Wayne Co-op handle that? We go through salary analysis pretty much on a regular basis, you know, top to bottom from that standpoint. It, it, it's problematic and the smaller you are, the worse it is, to be honest, truthfully honest with you. And sometimes you have to work on employees' empathies and so forth like that. When I come into this industry, they told you, you're never going to get rich. <laughs> but you always have a job and you'll always like what you do. So for the most part, it, it, it just kind of how, how you tailor it. And, and even better yet, make sure you give a great benefits package. That in and of itself, people will sacrifice a little bit on pay as long as you can give them a great benefits package, which is what I've been lucky enough to do with crafting with our board of directors. Okay. Awesome way to end this particular webinar. So thank you so much to all of you who have attended and our panelists, Jeff Rice, Tony C1, Tony C2, Marguerite, such a beautiful name, and Joe D'Souza. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for participating. Fa fantastic insights on this problem. I have a feeling we will be discussing this again. So for everyone that attended, thank you. Until next time. I'm Nick Lamparelli.